Even though the, the talk is not meant to be funny, feel free to laugh anytime you want to. <laughs> <laughs> so in many ways, this talk is I've been at this game of trying to get sort of what we call metadata and then semantic web, then linked data, and all these things going for, geez, I mean, almost 17 years now. The first time it started off with me at Apple trying to, to, to figure out how to squeeze KR into the simplest, simple, a thing simple enough that webmasters could use. Um, it's been sort of a, a strange and tortuous journey. <laughs> kind of reminds me of the Grateful Dead song, What a Strange Trip It's Been. And in parts of it, this might seem like a personal perspective, uh, so bear with me for that. <clears throat> Most of the talk, however, is about this entity that we created a couple of years ago, together with Microsoft and Yahoo and Yandex, um, called schema.org. I'm going to talk about the guiding principles, how far we've come along, um, how things are going, and then I'm going to invite my partners in this, um, from Bing and um, Yahoo and Yandex, um, to come give short presentations of what they are doing with it, and then tell you a little bit about where we think we're going in the future. So this whole thing started off about 16 years ago. Uh, there was a huge amount of work that was going on. There was the PIX activity that was going on for parental, so that you know there was all these people saying the world is going to end because there's porn on the web. Clearly, you need metadata to, to allow parental filters. And believe it or not, that was one of the, the guiding, motivating forces for what we look at as uh, linked data today. There was all this noise starting off about XML. Microsoft was doing this thing called CDF. There were at least half a dozen proposals to try and do sitemaps. The interesting thing was that each of these proposals, and there was a huge amount of activity then. This was 96, 97 time frame. Uh, uh, each of these things had, num had companies starting up around them, and so on and so forth. And um, one afternoon, um, summer of 97, if four of us, Ora Lassia, Ralph Swick, uh, five of us, Eric Miller, and um, Tim Bray and me met for about a day, half a day at MIT, trying to figure out it clearly there isn't room for 20 different formats, and we're going to just inundate the, the community with this. And um, at the end of the day, it became very, very clear that even though there were many different problems that we were trying to solve, these were all different problems in terms of their applications, picks and metadata and sitemaps and so on, there was kind of one unifying simple idea. And the simple idea was that today what we have, is, at that time what we had was a web that was meant for humans. Even at that time, it became, we were getting into the mode of the web where um, there were structured databases, not just static HTML files, structured databases, and there were scripts of different sorts that were pouring content into HTML that could be consumed by humans. And clearly, uh, while the people who had metadata, the people who had parental information, and so on and so forth, were happy to give them to us, it was all in kind of, it was in a haphazard fashion. It was not possible for people to extract it. And what we wanted was a much cleaner, or at least to us, it seemed like a much cleaner vision, which is that we had structured data, which was accessed not just by the web server for supplying to the human beings, but also by applications, other applications, which could be either on the same site or across the web. Uh, even as early as 97, we already were seeing the beginnings of applications like this especially in things like stock uh, codes and so on and so forth, where there were services that were appearing that were doing this. Weather was another, uh, uh, weather da related data was another uh, sort of a vertical where this kind of stuff was emerging. This is all very abstract, so you know, we want access to the structured data independently by applications and so on. Here's a concrete thing, Chuck Norris always works. Um, so you have IMDB, which was already up at that time, and the bottom is Rotten Tomatoes. I don't remember where the Rotten Tomatoes was up. And these are the pages on these two sites for Chuck Norris. They both say they have some common thing in them. In particular, the Chuck Norris uh, is an actor. He was born in this place called Ryan, Oklahoma, and he was born in, uh, on March 10, 1940. And we wanted to be able to say this in a fashion which is independent of the text, um, which is in, in a fashion which anything could understand. And again and again, here I was trying to draw this diagram like this out. And at some point, people said, that is what we want them to give us. And the thing that became clear immediately, and it became, it was almost like a, 
it's a meme, it was a religion at some point, that you could take pretty much anything you wanted and pour it into these directed labeled graphs, right? And we're all familiar with this notion then. And, and, and um, these are the kinds of things that came up with. We wanted everybody to take as much of their structured data, their metadata as possible, and put it into these graphs so that applications across the bit consumed. So what did it take to get there? So it was clear, there were two things that were required. And um, the first thing that was the most important thing was that how does the author give us this data? Well, we needed a syntax. There was a little bit of question about the data model itself, and I'll come to that in a minute. There was clearly we needed a syntax. And then we needed the vocabulary. We needed terms like type and author and date of birth and so on. And then we needed a way of identifying this op these objects. We needed a way of identifying uh, Chuck Norris independent of these different sites. We needed a way of identifying Ryan, Oklahoma, and actor, and type, and birthplace, and all these things. All those re required machinery. And this is also kind of a com nice computer science problem um, that we all really liked. Um, and oh, I'm sorry, I forget. Uh, and as a community, we did forget. Um, why should the author give us this data? Right? Um, what we did was we went depth first. There were many, many, many heated battles. And you know, a lot of us who are still around now were a lot younger then, and we had a lot more enthusiasm for flame wars. And the, you know, for those of you who want to see the RDF flame wars, you should go back to the 97, 98 mailing list. These things were small things would go on. And you know, Senti thread, we had like, you know, much, much, we had a Senti thread a day. Uh, on these kinds of issues. There were lots of proposals, there were standards, there were companies, there were debates about the data model, for example. The whole XML community said, all you need is XML, you don't need anything else. Uh, and when you pointed out that it'd be, it would be good to have a data model, the answer was, who needs one? Or if you need one, it's a tree. Um, there were people who wanted the director labeled graph, the one true religion. And there were others who said, no, you can't have a universal data model. You need one for real estate, and a different one for math, and a different one for this, and a different one for that. Um, syntax. The syntax was a legendary. There's just plain XML, do whatever you want, damn it, versus R uh, RDF. And the whole JSON world had not yet started then, but the JSON world would join in. Uh, the most glorious wars, of course, were for were model theory, uh, until my dear friend Pat Hayes uh, came in, uh, most of the people were like, what's that? And after you explain the model theory to them, they said, who cares? Um, and then uh, Pat Hayes said, we need one. It doesn't really need one, but we need one. Um, there were, it's just a, if you look back, there was a huge amount of work. In 96, as uh, Chris mentioned, I did this thing called Meta Content Format Framework from Apple, 97. This thing was cast into uh, uh, the X, in sort of an XML notation. Um, there were SS, S expressions actually proposed somewhere in the middle. Uh, RDF, RDFS, uh, and then you got the description logic community of things, DAML, OWL, et cetera. Um, around O3, you had microformats, which came and said to hell with all the stuff, we're just going to do something else. There were so many, so many, so many more things that were created. Sparkle and Turtle and N3 and FOF and, you know, uh, and this is all good. I mean, some of these things were things which, many of these things were things which I had my uh, finger in the pie, and they're all good, and they're all great and wonderful. Um, they had, you know, model theory and inferencing and type systems and this and that. Uh, they just lacked one thing. None of them got traction. And by traction, there's two kinds of things. One is, there's, a, there's the, we are, many of us were academics, and the goal is to build a system that could do something that could, had not been done before. And this was similar to the psych goal. We were trying to build an AI. There was no notion of large-scale adoption and so on. The dream was that we would be building it, and one day it would wake up and say, hello, daddy. Uh, well, that didn't happen. But the point is not adoption. We didn't require a large number of people to build it, to, to use it, or to build on top of it. It was not a platform. And when we came into this world, we kind of forgot that that was our goal. Uh, our goal is different this time, right? What we wanted or what we needed here is we needed a very large number of people to adopt our platform, and that wasn't happening. Um, at the end of all this, and I'm being very charitable here by saying that less than 10,000 sites were using these standards, it was far smaller number, and clearly something was missing, and it was not language features. And the answer is we had forgotten to give 
webmasters a good reason to do what we ask them to do. Um, as an aside, there's, there's one, there were a few stray sort of beacons of hope. There was this thing which I did at Netscape with Eckhart Walter and a couple of others called RSS. And RSS came out because Yahoo was just eating Netscape's lunch in terms of the portal. Uh, it was a f common thing in those days. You know, Microsoft would eat Netscape's lunch in the browser wars. Yahoo would eat us Netscape's lunch in the portal. Uh, and AOL came and ate the whole thing. But before that happened, uh, we, had, we wanted to have a My Page. And Yahoo had a My Page. And that was the envy of everybody in Silicon Valley, where you could go and choose which modules you wanted. Now, in order for us to have our own My Page, we needed a biz dev person to go do a bunch of deals so that we could get these little modules of content. And we didn't have a budget for the biz dev person. So we said, why don't we just make it an open format so that everybody could publish their channels, as they were called that day, and you could go along and pick whichever ones you wanted. And I vaguely remember being asked, really? Who's going to do that? Who's going to publish a channel? And the New York Times said, we will never, ever publish a channel, because that would mean people should come to you first as opposed to us. Um, our goal then was, you know, if in three years we have 5,000 channels, it'll be a huge win. We launched it, and something really, really interesting happened. Uh, about two or three weeks after we launched it, I got a call from somebody or an email from somebody said, you know, the Mormon church, they have an RSS feed now. I was like, what? I mean, like, what the hell is going on? Is this some kind of a joke? So I, I tracked them down, and I called them. And they said, oh, yeah, it's a, it makes absolute sense for us. We can't expect all our people to make the Mormon church, their homepage. But they'll make you your homepage, and we can reach them through that. Right? And within a fairly short period of time, New York Times had turned over. Even Yahoo had started using an, uh, uh, RSS feeds for customizing my Yahoo. And the last time I looked, um, we were well over 5,000. We were like 50 million plus RSS feeds in the web. Right? And it was a, compared to all the other things that were going on, it was a trivial piece of software. It was a p trivial design. Uh, and it got mutated and this and, and, and so on and so forth. But it answered that one question really, really, really well, which is, why should I do it? The whole, this whole linked data, getting larger number of sites to put up structured data, et cetera, kind of went to a quiescent phase until about 2007. And the credit goes to, uh, and, and there was what I call the rise of the consumers. There were a set of people who came in not because, came into the scene not because they thought it would be a good idea for large number of people to be giving us structured data, but because they had a problem to solve. Uh, it's what I call the rise of the consumers. You had uh, Yahoo produce Search Monkey. You had Google Rich Snippets, Facebook Open Graph, uh, and then, then Yandex also did uh, their version of these things. And these things offered webmasters a very, very, very simple value proposition. You give us structured data. We make your results look nicer because of which you get more traffic. And in a matter of two, three years, usage began to take off like crazy, and it went up by like a factor of 1,000. So it's actually interesting to see how these, you know, to give, let me just walk through a few of these things that were done. Yahoo Search Monkey was the first. And Yahoo Search Monkey basically said, look, I'm going to give websites control over their snippet presentation. You produce your, you know, you chose whichever vocabulary you wanted. Um, I don't remember, I think they supported RDFA or RDF, some version of this, um, or microformats. Um, you produce, gave an XSL style sheet, and um, you could kind of sort of take over this stuff. Uh, they had a couple of issues. The, the, moderation, the adoption was pretty good, way, way better than what the kind of adoption we had seen for similar things in the past. Uh, but the problem was that there were far too many choices in what you could do. And also expecting, and the XSLT gave too much power in, the represent, in, the, in what could be done, so it had to be manually reviewed, if I remember right. And there were a bunch of these kinds of issues. Um, Yandex produced something very uh, similar. Uh, they also integrated with maps and a bunch of these things. They introduced, so Yahoo introduced some, some of its own vocabularies and used, allowed people to use vocabularies from everywhere. Um, Yandex produced its own kinds of vocabularies. Um, Google got into it, I think it was 2009, and got into it in a very big way. So for example, you, know, you have these reviews uh, um, on so many sites. Um, they give you a vocabulary. Uh, it was a mix ma mishmash of different kinds of vocabularies. And we didn't allow you to play around with the presentation. You got a single presentation in the case of, so reviews was a big um, one of the rich snippets. 
Another one was people, which took off like crazy. Uh, we still, you know, we, at that point, we uh, decided we were going to support um, the H um, uh, card, which is still the biggest driver for H. This is still the biggest driver for H card in the web. Um, we did events, which was still being supported, so that if you got a result from events, we actually listed these things, uh, the events in that venue. Uh, recipes was actually the, probably the most sophisticated uh, uh, um, implementation where you had, whenever you had, um, you could give us your recipe in some fairly detailed uh, language, and then we allowed the user to slice and dice the results based on this. Um, the usage really, in the, the, the interesting points were they were multi-syntax. We were refusing to commit to a single syntax. We supported microformats. We had RDFA. We had a whole bunch of different things. It was, there was a bunch of things which were wrong with it. The uh, adoption was moderately successful. Uh, we had a few tens of thousands of sites use it. And you have to remember that when we say moderately successful, you had uh, prior to, you had the web, which was sitting at um, you know, tens of millions of websites. You had previous attempts at the semantic web, which were sitting at hundreds of websites, right? And this was kind of somewhere over here. We still needed to get to, to this range. Um, one of the things which we did, which was the right thing in retrospect, was that we experimented a lot with each of these user interfaces. So when we look at these things, we might have run at least 10 experiments for this particular user interface, till we settled on this user interface for recipes, uh, or this interface for events, or this interface for people, or this interface for reviews. Because the basic reason was that it had to produce value to the user, and that was, and we knew it was producing value to the user if the CTR on these results went up, and therefore it was producing value to the webmaster, and the ecosystem was going. And just to give you an idea of the strength of this ecosystem, it was typically for things like recipes, a matter of weeks at most months before we would have you know, 70, 80% coverage of the sites in that vertical. So what that means is that within a few months, at most, 70, 80% of the, of the major recipe sites would have uh, the, the appropriate markup. The two things that were happening is that there were serious scaling issues with the vocabulary. We were had, you know, we had, I think, two or three different versions of person and two or three different versions of start time and this and that and so on and so forth. The situation in 2010, as I said, you know, too many choices for webmasters. They had to do one thing to, to fit into for Yahoo, a different thing for Google, and a different thing for different vocabularies in Google. There were N versions of people. The biggest problem for us was that um, there was a lot of bad markup. Some of these things were really very, very, very complicated. Um, 40, I mean, RDFA at that time was very complicated, and about 40% of the markup was wrong. And it's difficult, and it took us a lot of effort to build algorithms which could distinguish between sort of um, uh, nefarious uh, spam which had bad intentions versus just wrong markup because somebody did not know what they were trying to do. And, and by one estimate, about 40% of all RDF mark, RDFA markup on the web was wrong. You know, when you say that um, the cooking time is, or the, the amount of sugar that's required is 20 cups and the amount of flour that's required is two teaspoons, it's very difficult to sort of write a program that figures that out, but a human, you require a human being to read it and find out that hey, that's not probably what they meant, right? Because at the end of the day, the user cares about uh, the results. They don't care about whether the quality of the markup. Um, the absolute adoption numbers were kind of still low on the lower side. They were less than 100,000 sites. So in the meantime, the web had grown. There's uh, at least 25 million active websites, uh, trillions of web pages. Um, on an average day, we estimate that over 5 billion pages change. Um, they, and and if we had to fit into this world, not the world of 1996. You're having scaling problems in every single way. So in 2009, um, we, you know, I approached Chi Lu, who was at that time at Microsoft, uh, to say that, look, there's a bunch of, of areas in which the major search engines, who are pretty powerful to, as a group, can collaborate. And then if we can all come together and say, look, webmasters, just use the following common vocabulary. If you use this vocabulary, we will all understand it. 
and we will make it so then you don't have to do a different vocabulary for us. We may do different things with this vocabulary and this markup, but you don't have to worry about that. It is a vocabulary, and, and since we started, and one of the things that we've been very bad at at schema.org is making it very clear that schema.org has no intention of being the vocabulary. It is a vocabulary. It is a vocabulary that is intended to reside and work alongside many other vocabularies. Uh, it's kind of distressing to me when I see talks given by, you know, including some people in this audience saying, ah, oh, schema.org, watering it down, taking over, doesn't see the full vision, blah, blah, blah. Go ahead and do all that stuff. We have a genuine problem as a community when after 15 years of meeting together and trying to break the web, do something, our adoption is still under 1%. We have a problem when we are forever the next big thing. You know, after 10 years of being the next big thing, you're no longer the next big thing. This problem was intended, schema.org was intended, was introduced so that we can go to webmasters and say, yes, you can do all kinds of wonderful stuff, but if you don't want to deal with that, you want a place where you can use a vocabulary amongst, alongside many others that is recognized by Google, Yahoo, Yandex, Bing, and some others, then this is a vocabulary that you can use. So that's what we started. And here's the report card. 15% of all the websites on the web and growing now have schema.org. There's over, and we're being very conservative in these numbers over here. We're being very, very conservative. Over 5 million websites, over 25 billion entity references. In other words, it's off, now of the same order of magnitude as, of the, as the web as a whole. It's not just promising new stuff. You go talk to anybody and everybody, right? Yeah, it's in their pipeline of doing things. Um, it's not a separate new thing which will be looked at when it succeeds. And that's the growth graph. Um, I'm not sure if you can see the dates. It starts off with 10611 and ends with, one, uh, and, and, uh, ends with October uh, 1st of this year. That's the rate at which this beast is going. Um, this thing is growing very, very, very fast, and um, we'll be sharing some more details with you in a few minutes. And over the next six months, nine months, the growth rate is going to accelerate even more because some of the major platforms on the web, like Drupal and um, WordPress, have decided to put it into their core. So in more detail, here are some of the major sites that are using it. Most of the major news sites use it, New York Times and Guardian and so on. Uh, the movie guys do it. Uh, for a bunch of reasons, the jobs sites, uh, careers.com, Monster, Indeed, they all use it. It's huge when the product community, eBay, Alibaba, Sears, uh, videos, medical information, local um, events, and clearly when we have like five million sites, we can just list a few over here, but it's a mainstream thing. It's not these sites you've never heard of. It's sites that we all use all the time and all now doing this stuff. And yes, Chuck Norris's both IMDb and Rotten Tomatoes are marking up their data uh, so that we know who Chuck Norris really is. Uh, these are some of the major categories that are used. Person, offer, and, and the top one is the categories in terms of the number of times it occurs. Uh, one of the things that comes up is that there's, you know, there's, I should point out, there's an uh, open graph, which is from uh, Facebook, which has actually even more pages and even more sites that are using it. Uh, but open graph tends to be for a different kind of usage. They focus on just a single entity at the top of a page. So um, um, the um, schema.org has far, is, is denser, and we're talking to each other all the time, and we're trying to figure out if we can come up with a system that combines the best of both. We have uh, the combined coverage with the kind of density that um, schema.org has. Um, and these are the kinds of, you know, these are the most, uh, the categories used by most number of domains. And there's a few in, uninteresting things like web page and so on, but you can see there's a lot of interesting things like place and event and, and ratings are very big. Um, image galleries, books, recipes. These are the most common um, properties. Um, many of these things like hiring, uh, regions, uh, it's, you can see these things. It's, there's a huge variety of properties and, um, and categories and things like that. Right. The schema.org is uh, on the order of about 1,200, 1,300 terms and is growing at a moderate pace. And uh, while adoption is not uniform across all types and properties, it's pretty intense. Um, 
There's a few simple principles uh, that we followed, that we always, you know, we follow for when it comes to designing new vocabularies. Probably the most important is simplicity. Um, and by simplicity, we don't mean simplicity in design, because that often means simplicity for the people consuming the data. It's simplicity for the people who are doing the markup. Often there's a trade-off. You can make the thing simple for the authors or simple for the people consuming the data, and we go sharply on the, in the direction of making it simple for the authors. Um, it's meant for the consumers you know, between Yahoo and Bing and Google and so on. We can write the code that's required to figure out these things. Now, you shouldn't be able to just stop at the simple stuff. For people who want to be able to do complex things, you should be able to do it. Um, there's, and, and this is not just in terms of the syntax, uh, though it started off with the syntax. We did this thing called microdata, and we did this very interesting study where we had a whole bunch of different proposals, and we didn't know, because we knew that there was an issue with RDFA, we actually did a bunch of, of usability studies, got webmasters, didn't tell them that they were helping design the new web standard, asked them to represent stuff, and saw which ones they made the least number of errors in. And microdata was designed because of that. And it's not surprising that the error rates that you get with microdata are much, much, much lower than what you get with anything else. The good thing is that RDFA Lite 1.1 or something, I forget which, which version, is now almost a mirror of microdata. And we're hoping that we'll see similar lower error rates. We also realized that it's not, I mean, RDFA Lite and, and microdata are all, are all alternatives, but there's other alternatives for the syntax that are coming online, like JSON-LD. Um, and we're going to use all of these things. We can't, and, and it has to fit in with existing workflows, which is why we're taking in things like JSON-LD. The other important things are, you can't expect a webmaster to go study a tutorial on knowledge representation. Uh, we all understand, you know, it's like a person who doesn't know knowledge representation, I mean, they should know it, right? I mean, it's like not knowing lambda calculus. How can you live with yourself? Um, <laughs> But there are those, and we have to live with them. And so we can't expect these people to know these kinds of tools. Um, we can't, which also meant a bunch of other things. So I'll give you an example. So many of our ontology systems and so on have these concepts like agent and something, and at Psych had things like something existing, and these things were required because you said clearly a proper, uh, properties need to have domains and ranges, and clearly that needs to be a single type, and therefore we need this category. And you put a person, a webmaster, in front of the stuff, and they go like, what the hell are these things talking about? So we decided to bite the bullet there. You know, properties can have multiple ranges, multiple types. Uh, it's a very simple, it's not too flat. It's kind of, it's optimized for understandability. Categories, and we don't have a thing called agent, which covers all these funky notions. They need to be concrete. They need to be something that a webmaster can understand. They can say, yeah, that thing there is, I don't know what a legal agent is versus a sentient agent and so on. It's an actor. Cool. OK, fine. The default mode of authoring is copy and edit. That's how the web was created, copy and edit. Um, Schema.org site is not a long linear spec uh, that people read. And this was motivated in part. Um, the RDF tutorial, right? Or, um, or not tutorial, the uh, something which, um, not this actual spec, the, the, the primer. The RDF primer, you know, the MCF using XML, which was the original the proposal for RDF, was three pages. And I thought it was too long. The RDF primer was 110 pages. Nobody reads 110 pages. So we decided that schema.org was going to be sort of this, a tree of examples. You pick the one that is nearest to yours, and you copy and edit. Um, no author needs to have a global view of everything that's happening. We as consumers of this data might want to have a global view because we take data from multiple sources. But if you're the author of IMDB or, or one of these sites, you care about the movies and acting area of the tree. That's it. You don't care about the whole thing. Um, everything is incremental. We started off with about 100 categories at launch. And it applies to every, now we are at around 1,300. And it applies to every area where uh, we add complexity after we have some traction. And there are lots of areas like medical vocabularies where we don't believe we've got traction. There are other areas like events where 
we don't even have real applications that use it, but we already have 75,000 sites that are using the markup, right? And so we have traction. We are adding more stuff over there. Um, uh, we go back and fill in the blanks. We have no problem in saying we made a mistake, and that's very, very important. One of the big issues that come up, comes up often, and uh, an issue that the semantic web community has kind of tied itself, um, tied, uh, gotten uh, hung up on, is the issue of URIs or names. So if you go back to this chart, this, this graph about Chuck Norris, um, you have a few thousand terms like actor and birth date and so on and so forth. And if you take any particular site, like IMDB, they are interested in about 10 of 20 of these things. You can expect them to go hardwire their scripts and their, generation, their, their, their pages that generate their, the scripts that generate their pages and put these terms in. There's about on the order of tens of thousands of terms like the USA. You could maybe have external enumerations come from canonical sources like Wikipedia and have them point to it. There's tens of millions of things, or hundreds of millions of things like Chuck Norris and Ryan Oklahoma. We gave up on the idea that there will be URIs for these things. It will not happen. We cannot reasonably expect IMDB to coordinate with Rotten Tomatoes, to coordinate with everybody else to pick on the canonical URL for Chuck Norris. It's not going to happen. So what do you do? Well, you, what we do is we have this notion of reference by description. We'll give you a description. You know, Chuck Norris, he was born here, he was doing this, uh, uh, and he's an actor in these movies and, and so on. And we, the consumers, the onus is on us to do the very heavy lifting to reconcile references across these different sites. And this actually means that we can construct a very large semantic web with agreement on a few thousand terms. That's it. And this is kind of one of the foundational principles of what we are doing. The other thing, big foundational principle, is collaborations. We don't do things all by ourselves. And I'd like to get Dan Brickley, who does most of the actual running of schema.org on a day-to-day -day basis, to come and talk about that. I, one thing I think we got right with the idea of schema was it was kind of pluralistic by design. You could have types in the graph, edges in the graph, created by independent communities who didn't have to sit in the same expensive meeting room, fly to the same expensive working group meetings. They could just come up with their stuff, in it goes into the graph. And I, I think that principle is, it stayed core in the semantic web community over the years. But somehow we've, we've ended up kind of fetishizing it and giving it, giving it the wrong place in our hearts. So can I just do a quick straw poll? Um, who knows who invented the HTML table tag? Guha? Uh, the H1 tag in HTML? All right, an easy one. Image tag? Nobody. But you still use it every day. It's hugely important. So for us, the schema.org is a project to help improve the web. The Semantic Web Project is a project to help improve the web. And sometimes I think the, the pluralism in RDF schema has got in the way of really the ultimate goal, which is improving the web. <coughs> um, what we've done with schema.org is we've, we've kept the credits, we've kept the history, we've kept the links to where these things came from, but we don't put them in the face of webmasters. You don't ask every webmaster to remember that person comes from the FOF project, the title comes from the Dublin Core project, the rights comes from the Creative Commons project, and so on and so on and so on. Um, we, we kind of packaged up a lot of semantic web ideas and represented them to a mainstream audience. We don't necessarily care for that history. Um, but the history is there if you look. It's there on the website. We're doing most of our discussion now in public. If you want to find out you know, if a certain idea came from e-commerce and good relations or came from bibliography and the library discussions around Ferber, jump into the mail archives, and you'll, you'll never come out. There are thousands of posts there. Um, so what we've done as a, as a way of building out schema.org is we've moved discussion into W3C, into public mailing lists, into wikis and issue trackers there. Now, the attributions for where those things come from, if you click through to schema.org, every term gets, every property and every type gets a page. We've linked to, to history there. There's a lot of uh, collaborations. I think initially with schema.org, they were more kind of formal partnerships. You know, the IPTC R News group got together with Guhar and so on, and they, they came up with a plan. What we're doing more recently is much more kind of organic, fluid, everybody on a bunch of mailing lists. So you've got here 
like the, the R News guys, um, Martin Hepp, who is, who is Good Relations. And we've also got a lot of bibliographic experts who've come in from, from the library community. We've got accessibility experts. We've got BBC, the EBU, all helping design this thing. And it's not nicely partitioned. So to give an example, if you've got a TV and radio show and it's broadcast on the web as a stream and you want to describe its educational characteristics, yeah, historically in, in the link data scene, you have to decide, is this from the educational schema or is this from the TV and radio schema? Um, by chucking it all in one gigantic namespace, we kind of make that, that discussion go away. It's just people collaborating. So another example is if you're describing the accessibility, the wheelchair accessibility ramp outside a restaurant or a conference center, should that go in your geo schema or should that go into your accessibility schema? The, the world is just not nicely partitioned in this way. Um, so we've essentially got a melting pot where all these conversations can happen without worrying about putting it into a category, putting it into a namespace. I, I won't say a lot here except making things easier for publishers is absolutely central. So Drupal 8 switching from using half a dozen different RDF vocabularies to using uh, schema.org, which itself is an aggregate of many different projects. Uh, it's, it's really exciting. We should see Drupal 8 coming out in the spring. Um, how does it work in practice? We've got the web schemas group at W3C. That's technically it's a task force of the semantic web interest group that I chair. Basically, it's a mailing list and a wiki and a, a version file system. So Eve Raymond, who's hopefully here somewhere. Where's Eve? At the back. Uh, a couple of days ago, he was committing changes into the Mercurial repository uh, from a conversation with Ian from Microsoft sat here at the front. Um, that, the result of that is an RDF schema file expressed in RDFA. When that conversation settles down, maybe later this week, we'll put it into the build process, turn a handle, new version of schema.org comes out the other end. Um, so we, we're trying to operate you know, more like a software project, I guess, than, than like a formal standards initiative. Uh, sometimes you do have a focused topic, and one big, one big mailing list is not really what you want. Uh, so W3C, this laptop's doing things in front of me. And W3C has the notion of a community group. Uh, you can go along to W3C with a topic of interest, a few other people to start a group. You can create a mailing list wiki, the whole works. If that group comes up with a schema, uh, first off, we're interested to have that folded into schema.org. What's it doing? Oh, Lord. It's alive. It's picked this uh, moment to do an update. Secondly, W3C are happy to host you your own independent namespace on w3.org slash ns. Uh, so we're trying to find the best of both worlds, really. Uh, <laughs> Go on, don't mind me. What was I going to say? <laughs> I think that's about it, really. One thing we've done for this conference is there's a, a room book listed in your schedule, uh, some of tomorrow, some of Friday. It's just a drop-in center. If you want to get together with other people from the conference and talk about schemas, with an eye in particular to getting them into schema.org, um, we've made that space available. We're not having the schema.org team stand there on duty for the whole conference. Uh, but yeah, get together, use it, use the W3C list or the wiki to, to coordinate. At that point, I'm passing over to Ian, whose slides have disappeared into the depths of Windows. <laughs> <laughs> Come on up and tell us a few things about schema.org, and I'll reboot my laptop. <laughs> Uh, so I'm, I'm Ian Niles. I uh, work for Microsoft. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, just, I'll put this up so you can. Uh, yeah. go ahead. Where's my promo. deck? Okay. So um, let's see. So we've been working um, on schema.org as part of this collaboration. And uh, the way we use um, schema.org is with the, uh, at this point, with the Bing rich snippets. So we try to recognize entities within those snippets and then, and then tag them. And hopefully that creates a, a better user experience. Um, so the, for the future, we're going to be using uh, the, uh, the schema.org types and properties with uh, other Microsoft products and services. Um, I think that's about it. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm good. Wow, this is loud. All right. So, I think my name is Peter Rick. I work for for Yahoo um, Labs in Barcelona. So, 
I think Guha already mentioned that they are sort of one of the original instigators of rich results in web search. Uh, actually, what have, have we have done in 2011 is publish a paper which essentially tries to prove that they actually work, right? So, so taking a look at uh, how rich results help people to determine relevance, right? Relevance of the, of the page. One thing that we're presenting at this conference is another use case of essentially the same um, entity graph idea, but applied to entity recommendations in web search. I wanted to say a few words about some of the other use cases that are not necessarily search related, but uh, in the context of uh, media sites, uh, you probably know that Yahoo is one of the largest publishers in the web in terms of, in terms of original content as well as syndicated content. One thing we do there is to apply schema.org to our own pages. So essentially, we're using a lot of the article, photo, and video markup. We are also very active in schema.org in some of the particular vocabularies, like uh, Q&A discussions and sports. Uh, I want to say a few words about how we use this for personalization. And in that case, uh, what you might see on the Yahoo homepage is essentially um, the entities that we extract from the pages. Some of these are actually modeled in an entity graph that is, again, using the schema.org vocabularies. If you want to know more about this particular entity graph, there was a presentation at Semtech uh, by a colleague of mine, Nikola Torzak, and that you can still look up on the web. I wanted to give a shout out to sort of the, the local Yahoo's, Yahoo 7, is a joint venture between Yahoo and seven media networks here in Australia. And there's some very brilliant folks there applying semantic technologies to their own sites. So uh, this particular example that they gave me is a show called Home and Away, which is a popular TV series uh, here in Australia. It's about um, a bunch of young and very sexy looking people discussing semantic technologies. Um, <laughs> Well, not really, uh, but it seems that the site itself is triples all the way down. Um, it's, it's based on a triple store, and it does a fantastic job in essentially linking unstructured content, reviews, articles, uh, quotes from the characters, from the transcripts, to, to structured data uh, that, uh, that they have about the shows. So if you are interested in some of these media-oriented use cases, you can find some of the Yahoo 7 folks here at the conference. Or you can talk to me and I point them out for you. All right, so I think that's what I wanted to say. And now we pass on to Yandex. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Yulia Tichohot. I'm from Yandex. And uh, in Yandex, we use schema.org too. Uh, first of all, we have a new product. Uh, it's uh, Yandex Islands. It's about interaction between user, uh, search engine, and websites. Uh, it's not about just about search. It's about solving the tasks. Uh, user came, comes uh, to our search engine and uh, uh, give us a question about some tasks. For example, check-in uh, to uh, the flight. And we give him an interactive block where he can put name, surname, departure, flight, and just check in. And he uh, came directly into a uh, page with boarding pass. Uh, it sounds good for me, uh, but it's impossible without webmasters. And for uh, get data about flight, about uh, departure city, and about uh, these forms, uh, we use schema.org actions with J in JSON LD syntax. And uh, it's not one, only one product in, in which we use schema.org. Uh, we use it uh, in our enhanced uh, snippets, in our web services uh, vertical searches, like movie, uh, vi uh, video, uh, like uh, di directory images, and other web, uh, uh, vertical service, uh, searches. And we use schema.org uh, also for algorithms. Uh, for example, for Yandex uh, Family Search, we use uh, people audience to give people uh, data appropriate for them. For example, for little childs. 
And here are some maybe useful links in uh, Yandex documentation and uh, validator when we, you can uh, check uh, your markup uh, and uh, Yandex Islands better ver version. That's all. I know Chris wants me to finish up, but I'm going to you know, take back the time that is spent, computer is spent rebooting. Uh, so applications drive adoption. And we have a first generation of applications which are richer presentations of search results. And, um, but this, how come it? <laughs> Yeah, okay. But there's many new interesting applications coming out, which are many, many of which, are, some of which are on the search results page, and many of which are well beyond that. And, um, and these will also expand the scope of what uh, this whole endeavor is expected to be. So let me just go through a few of them. Uh, Google introduced this thing called the knowledge graph, and, and there was a lot of press about it. And it's interesting because what we are doing over here, this is a simple example where it's, you know, back to our movies example, where we recognize that this markup is about, you remember I was talking about reference by description and so on, and all that fun stuff is working, and we recognize that this markup is about this entity. We pull it out, we present it there, and we give the user a reason to go off and learn more from these websites. Here's another example where <clears throat> there's this group called of Monsters and Men. I believe they, they play some music. Um, and we understand where the user is. There's some events coming up uh, next to where the user is, and we integrate that. So this is very large scale integration going on from different parts of the web into this main knowledge graph. And all these things happen you know, sort of on a, very, on a much, much larger scale than most people have thought of before. Um, here is a very different kind of a search application. So some, about a year and a half ago, the, in the US, we, there, was, there was lots and lots of, of soldiers returning from Iraq and Afghanistan. There was an issue with these veterans finding jobs. The White House created a program where an employer could say that a particular job was veteran friendly. They got some tax credit. How, how was the veteran going to find one of these jobs? So we created a markup in the job posting thing where they could say that this was veteran friendly. And uh, working together with the White House, Google created the search engine. And you could get this from nrd.gov, where it's a search for veteran friendly. It's a combination of structured data search, which is do normal text search, except with a certain set of restrictions um, uh, across the web, not just a single site. We've all done this kind of stuff in a single site. This is across the web. It's super powerful. Um, Many of you might have heard about something called Google Now. Uh, a lot of stuff which is going on in you know, the nearby events that you get and the X and Y and Z things you get are driven by this particular, uh, by schema.org markup. Um, Pinterest is kind of super interesting because Pinterest is the first company which is not a search engine company, at least not one you'd recognize as a search engine company, not part of the, the Kabbalah 4, which is actually decided to use um, structured uh, to, to use this mark, schema dot org markup in their own interesting way. Um, and they are using it to be sort of like when you have one of their pins, you can have more interesting information about the pin, and then they have a whole bunch of different things that are being planned. But I bring it up because it's a, an incredibly interesting breed of new applications beyond just search. Um, here is my favorite application, which is kind of it's a little, it's really, really geeky. You know, there's a site called Open Table in the US which allows you to make restaurant reservations. So when you make a restaurant reservation on Open Table, you get an email confirming the reservation. If you go and, and it's uh, base 64 encoded, unencoded, and then do view source, you'll find a whole lot of schema.org markup which tells you that this is a reservation for a restaurant at this location, blah, 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 blah. And this is super interesting because we then, uh, it, it, things like Gmail pick it up. It knows that you have a reservation at this restaurant in such and such time, and eventually, and this gets communicated to your Android phone, so that when you need to leave for the restaurant, it can tell you. I know it doesn't, it's not saving lives and you know, curing cancer and all that stuff, but having this beast work on scale for like tens of millions of users, right? Uh, and making sure this thing doesn't like start beeping alarms in the middle of night because you need it things you need to be at a restaurant in 15 minutes. That's really important. It turns out um, uh, it's actually quite a challenge. And to see this whole thing just work, and it's not just because of a special deal that was done with Open Table. Anybody and everybody is now plugging into this kind of a workflow. 
And this is the kind of vision that a lot of us had uh, over a decade ago. And it's actually quite gratifying to see this thing actually happen. Um, here is a fu future application, something that I would like to see happen, something which might cure cancer, which is that if you look at it right now, at, at any point in time, there's over 4,000 clinical trials that are going on in the US alone. And the unfortunate thing is that when a clinical trial happens, most of the raw data gets thrown away, and all that gets published is an abstract. Um, there's a huge amount of valuable information in this, um, in this. In, these, in this raw data. So for example, if you look at the last 15 years, one, two of the major results that have come out in women's, study, in women's health is that estrogen is not helpful and the pill does increase uh, cases uh, of cervical cancer. And these things didn't come about because of a new clinical trial. They came about because of a meta-analysis of pulling together, putting together, stitching together the data from multiple clinical trials. And we are actually talking, schema.org is talking informally with the NIH to help them take all their clinical trial data and put it online with at least a little bit of markup so that these kinds of analysis can go from being multi-million dollar, multi-tens of million dollar studies to something that can be done with, by say, a grad student as a term project. <clears throat> So just a couple of slides on what's happening. There's a huge amount of stuff in the pipeline. There's a lot of work that's going on on uh, action and events. Uh, Dan Brickley mentioned uh, work on action. And there's all the stuff, by the way. There's a web page uh, on W3C where you can look at all the things that we're working on, and all of the stuff is public. And you're free to come in and jump in on these things. And you know, um, communication, scholarly work, sports, commerce. Uh, message boards, there's a huge number of these kinds of things that are happening at any time. And you know, on an average, uh, we get about two or three of these things out every quarter. And we are going to sort of step up our pace over the next few quarters. <clears throat> there's two very big initiatives that are underway. Um, one of them is, I know we all love triples, but there's certain things that triples just can't do. And one of the very big things that they can't do, at least easily enough, is represent time. Uh, there's an awful lot of information in the world that is not true forever. Um, and we need to be able to associate time with it. And we are looking into simple mechanisms for how we may be able to do this. Another big thing is tabular data, where I would like to be able to say that you see that CSV file out there on the web over there, its meaning is such and such. So that many different sources can, can take it. And we're trying to come up with a simple schema for being able to say that. Uh, in the interest of academics, um, there's a bunch of hard research problems where, um, and, and let me just mention two of them, and, and if any, any of you are interested, I'd be happy to, me or any of my other uh, co-conspirators would be happy to talk to you about it. One of them is propositional attitudes, the whole issue where something, and I'd like to you know, put in a graph there, I don't want to say it's true. I want to think of it, I want to attach a certain epistemic status with it. It happens with fictional characters, and it happens a much more concrete case, which is actually very, very, very pressing for us, is I'd like to be able to say that I can do all of these things for you. So Netflix would, be, would like to be able to say, here's a movie. You can watch it, blah, 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 under this resolution, under these terms, et cetera. Or you can buy it, or you can stream it, or you can. It's not saying you are doing it. It's talking about propositional attitudes and possibilities and things like that. And we need to be able to give webmasters a way of saying it without accidentally saying that you did watch it because they also want to say that you did watch it. Right? Uh, and we need, we need to be able to do this without knowing Kripke semantics. Uh, the other huge interesting problem, which is still work in progress, is I just alluded to that we take all this data, which are just in a, the different Chuck Norris references and put them in to, together into a single coherent web of entities. That's a giant, giant problem. There's something like 2.3 million country references. And we know that they're not 2.3 million countries. right? And so these things have to be boiled down. And, and there's so many different ways you can say Australia. You'd be surprised. Uh, and this is a problem which is actually, I mean, as far as we can make out, it's, the, the back is still yet to be broken. So with that, let me conclude. Um, Schema.org gives webmasters a good reason for adding structured data markup. And again, let me repeat, uh, for the more advanced authors, they can go and do more sophisticated things while still getting the benefits of the basic markup. 
a basic core set of search-related applications have gotten it this far, and we'll continue taking it further, but we are now seeing the next breed of applications which are not necessarily just search. There's lots of interesting research problems left, but uh, as the title of my talk alluded to, uh, there seems to be light at the end of the tunnel. So with that, thank you. <laughs>